Hello. Hello. <laughs> Alexis and me, Peter. We just arrived at Steve Jurvetson's Future Ventures VC office, which is also a space museum. And it's arguably the largest space museum in private hands. So very excited to go there. Mm -hmm. In 2019, I did the first video. You can find that on YouTube. And then also in 2021, we did the set second together. Today will be the third time. Yeah, very excited. Can't wait to see all the extra artifacts and tidbits that yep. Steve always tends to, to add to his collection. So can't wait. Uh, if you take a quick look over there, so we'll be heading just across the street in a second here. So that's Future Ventures, the VC office of Steve Jurvetson. All right, welcome to Future Ventures and the third tour of Steve Jurvetson's uh, Space Artifacts uh, collection. Hello, welcome. Good to see you, Steve. Come on in. Thanks. Good to see you, Peter. Hi, Steve. Fantastic. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you've been doing this filming now on multiple episodes. I went back and looked at the 2019 one, and there were so many fewer things uh, in the office. It's hard to believe we fit yeah. as much stuff in here as we have. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> It'll be exciting once you expand the space too at some point, right? Exactly. Well, you might need more space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> always, well, as you'll see as we go around, we've now started to populate the ceiling. Uh, solar panels and sounding rockets, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, and then new walls. This, since you last came, we added this wall. And we, we can start with this hatch. This is a lunar module upper hatch. It, uh, it's remarkably light. It sort of reminds you. Wow. Yeah. It, it is here, like, right? There's. Oh, wow. It's a little wobbly, too. Oh, yeah. Careful, sorry. Right? <laughs> so, the, um, the lunar module, as you know, when it, 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 it couldn't really deal with pressure differentials uh, much at all. Hmm. Uh, so, when it's on the ground at atmospheric pressure, yeah. it has a pressure release valve yeah. that naturally vents to the outside as the Saturn V is lifting up. So it's simultaneous. So it's as you're heading from Earth to orbit, it yeah. goes from one atmosphere pressure to, to vacuum yeah. in perfect balance, thanks to the valve wow. um, that's on the door. So it's smart engineers for calculating those flow rates, right? And exactly. Make sure they're rated which you can have pressure yeah. differentials and how much, right. Yeah. And, uh, but also that's a source of a potential leak, you know, perpetual leak for the longer missions. <laughs> a very, you know, very, Rickety, small. Yeah, it was no one. Yeah, 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 and this is quite quite rare. Um, yeah. it, uh, I have a prototype of the hatch. I'll show you earlier. Where they were thinking maybe it would be a, a fully round thing, but there was a reason why they just they needed to cut off the side. But yeah. you know, the whole human with spacesuit would need to fit through this, and so it was it was not the most spacious of hatches. I'll show you the contrast from this little walk on this way to the International Space Station is very different, and that's one of the newer items that, that showed up. We'll, we'll go like in this order for a moment. So this, sorry, I forgot that, that they've all had this as the uh, as yeah. a design element. This is no other earlier. The, the flat. I have to go back and look at. I apologize. I have to go back and look at the design space that they had. Hmm. Um, but it was. I think there was something in the way that, that really they couldn't not have there. Yeah. The the pressure valve very different design back then. The thing yeah. we were just talking about. The handle is a little bit different. Yeah. This is a super early prototype. If I recall, it goes like way back. Uh, maybe to the early early sixties, but yeah, um, nineteen sixty four. Oh, you see it in there? Oh. Uh, it's on the placard on this on the window. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right, I should put that where where, uh, where it's a little more visible. Yeah, I'll figure that out later. But yeah, there you go. Nineteen sixty four. <laughs> then, if we come around this way, compare the size of the International Space Station hatch. Now, this is what is equivalent. This was a failed early. Um, Attempt it was machined out and everything mm. because getting the metallurgy to not have any Warping. irregularities yeah. or grain residual problems, stress, yeah, because this thing has yeah. taken an inordinate amount of stress in, in position and it slides laterally, kind of like a sliding glass door, oh. um, into place and it allows much larger uh, experiment packages and things to get loaded onto the ISS than, mm -hmm. than we ever had in the Apollo program. I'd imagine the mm -hmm. sealing process of a sliding thing, right, was oh, rather complex, exactly. yeah, exactly. And oh, you have. I have now. We have another of the lunar module ones just to show you the size differential. Wow. Um, it, Incredible! It's, it's quite tight. They also had to worry about cold welding up in space. Cold, cold, cold welding. Cold welding. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when uh, two metal pieces uh, don't corrode and touch in space, ah. if but they don't oxidize in an atmosphere, right? Oxidizing environment, then, then they there's second the materials that they will yeah. spontaneously yeah. bond. Yeah. So you need to have an exterior layer. I mean, aluminum does it naturally very quickly, but yep. yeah. interesting. Interesting. So let's see, let's go from hatches to walk 
back out this way. I don't think there's anything. We talked about this guy before. Yep. Yep. Why don't we make this a transition to some sounding rockets slash, well, that's just the stuff that's around here. So um, we'll get to solar panels in a way, in a moment. This is from 1967, Skynet 1. It was one of the earliest uh, you know, commercial satellites. You can see that it was part of the cylinder. Yeah. And some of the early ones like Telstar, I think, and others were spin stabilized. Um, so they sort of had a more of a cylindrical versus a lot of satellites that are boxy. Sure. Then Pioneer, there's some very early missions to the moon, even smaller solar cells. The part that, that I think is fascinating is you look at each of these little squares. Yeah. And you notice it's about the, the width of my of thumb, thumb, right? Yeah. And it's square. That's not a chip like we would think today. Oh, it's like, it's, how, do, how does that compare like to an NVIDIA chip? That is the maximum you can get from an entire wafer. So back the entire back wafer was a one inch diameter. <laughs> and then when you cut it to a square, that's all you got. So it must have been a lot of wafers. Exactly. Expensive to just to make one panel back then. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, a big part of the Apollo program is is it coupled to Moore's law, mostly on the compute side, but you know, solar and, and energy was important too. Yeah. And we'll get to some other panels. There's a JPL uh, Ranger, which was actually that triangle one you can see in the distance. Yeah. We'll get to that in a moment. But that was uh, the, the the initial attempts to get high resolution photos of the moon, and they had like six failures in a row. They like, missed the moon, and, and it's designed, by the way. It's fine. fine. We take this. Uh, this is how Program. you start. It's yeah. like it was basically designed to just crash into the moon. So it's brrr, taking photos. Yeah. yeah. Send before, the data. Before yeah. It hits. <laughs> Send the data back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it was tough to get working. Wow. This is pretty amazing and historic. Not many people would recognize it hmm. quite as easily as they would Sputnik, which is there's a shell of Sputnik hanging up there, yeah. spare from. Actually, yeah, Peter, if you want to just take just as a. As a reminder, for anyone who doesn't remember Sputnik, this, this silver orb with four spring-loaded antennas that were you know, slapped against the side of the rocket. And you know, when it launched into space, its only function was to beep. You know, it's like an RF beeper. Beep, beep. And so any ham radio enthusiast anywhere around the Earth could realize, like, oh my god, there it is. Yeah. Russia has put a satellite in orbit. No one had a photo. There's the, I've seen the best photo. It's a horrible photo. They weren't really what we take for granted, like, like you know, photo or it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So their point of establishing their, you know, first yeah. uh, in the space race, that kicked off the space race, yeah. was just a beeper for these antenna. And this was b built, a spare that was built um, for, by the same company that made Sputnik for a Russian museum. And I guess it's a little less dis uh, uh, disputable if any amateur can, mm -hmm. exactly. can actually pick it up, right? Versus exactly. U.S. government with specialized it. equipment. And the rate at which it went around and then came back again, it's yeah. like, oh, that's orbit. There's no other way. We know exactly what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, every 90 minutes it goes overhead. Wow. You know you're, uh, you know you're in orbit. Wow. So the U.S., though, here's what's less well-known globally, because number two, just not as famous as number one. Sure. Is the U.S. kicked off a crash program to do something very similar, hmm. and they got it done in three months. From when? From Sputnik launches. Oh crap! Let's do Explorer One. It also had four antenna, but instead of being longer and rigid against the side of the rocket, they were spin spin, spin stabilized, stabilized and just, yeah. you know, stick out. Yeah. And it did a little more. It did the beeping, okay. but it also sent back data on temperature, and I believe it had a radiation sensor as well. Hmm. So it did a little bit of science. Which is like, what's it like up there? Because with the hey, we did the first science, right? right? <laughs> exactly. And I have it on top of a spare, yes. but flown. Uh, we believe, or test fired. Let's just say flown or test fired. It's not clear which, but, but fired in some domain mm -hmm. of the X15 engine, which was this crazy yeah. rocket plane. X yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Right Actually, if you look up here, you can remind people what it looked like. So that's, that's a the, model just signed by a couple of the. The pilots. And then this is the engine below yeah, this. Yeah. The world's coolest uh, cocktail. Uh, the table. <laughs> <laughs> table. And here's a piece of wreckage uh, from one of the pilots who flew it from wow. yeah, tail number two, which crashed. Yeah. So th there were three of them. One right. of them didn't make it. Right. Um, and it was but, something about like shock interaction onto a strut that caused one of them to fail. Is that right? Oh, was that what, oh I don't know. Yeah. Th there was some sort of shock interaction that they didn't expect that led to one particular strut kind of burning oh, up. Oh, dear. Yeah. Yeah, it was incredible bravery. This is where Neil Armstrong first went to space, was on X-15, and he bounced off the atmosphere on an attempt to re-enter, in a sense, from, from space. Mm -hmm. So the angle of attack was a little learned the hard way, yeah. and almost had to do an emergency landing at LAX, uh, LA airport. Um, but managed <laughs> to get it back nice. around to that it white incredible. sands that he was launched from. Yeah, in fact, I had the windshield from the record-setting flight. Come, come over here, I'll show you something. Uh, We've come a long way from uh, the Explorer one, right? Oh, I know. Exactly. <laughs> oh, boy, have we ever. Um, but this, this is 
tucked away in a place that's a little harder to see, but this is was the red window. That is not only the it, window. It is the window that has the record setting flight, which is Mach 6.7. Uh huh. So we're we're just, we have no, yeah, 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 man flight. No, yeah. no, you know, man vehicle. There's these hypersonic scramjet things right, that right. that don't have people on it. Right. Uh, but sure, yes, sure. A human piloted flight, wow. far and away the record. So to give you a sense of how fast this is. Uh, a lot of people are excited about the SR-71 Blackbird, right? Yeah. This crazy ass plane, yeah. and it is. Yeah. Amazing air breathing engines. Yeah. Um, it's just incredible design, right? Children have been named after this thing. Is that right? <laughs> oh, the Blackbird. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, uh, it, uh, uh, if it was going at its record setting speed, mm -hmm. like it's full tilt, yeah, right? and if it was famous for being all outrun missiles, right? Service right. air missiles, right. they just go faster, you know, right? Sure. Uh, it's at its whole all speed. This would pass at a relative speed of Mach 3. You're like, it's like almost basically twice as fast compared to somebody on the ground. More than twice as fast. Yeah, yeah exactly. Incredible. Yeah, pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, back wow. to Rangers, the satellite that was on a spare from that program, but uh, we can look if you want. We can look up at that solar panel. But yeah, really interesting design for you know analog RF. Yeah. Uh, well, over right here we can just randomly. This is uh, one of those. Engines, the R4D, there's a quad of these on a little module, and they, uh, oh, with the cool sound. Nice. Move it on, yep. Yeah. So it's a simple engine. Yeah. There are a few of these in various places in Apollo where you just have two fuels that are uh, bipropellants, basically mm -hmm. uh, hypergolic fuels mm -hmm. that explode, you know, combust upon contact. So you don't yeah. need an igniter. Yeah. So there's no complexity of yeah. an igniter. There's just squirt the liquids in when they touch, yeah. and you have combustion. Yeah. So turn, I learned recently because there was a guy who wanted to analyze this in depth to build new modern engines today. And he still says it's like one of the best there are out there and it's still for sale yeah. uh, for an inordinate amount of money. Like, like, I think it's like millions of dollars for this little for engine. For one unit. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Wow. Yeah. Well, so and, he wanted to build his own. And that efficiency is from what, what sense? Is that well, it's just they somehow they figured out the throat design in a way that was not fully documented, perhaps. And... Uh, and maybe a bit of a, a state secret at the time. And there haven't been as many of these small thrusters that are hypergolic. Right, everybody's moving mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. on a larger scale. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think the Super Dracos probably outperform it, but I have to go back and look now. Sure. Um, but I mean, for being scale. built back. <laughs> exactly. I mean, for back then, it was amazing. Yeah. But the fact that someone today in a startup wants to recreate that. essentially this thrust profile yeah. Um, yeah. with a new design without buying them from Mark Work, it makes them. Yeah. Um, without having any compute back then. Sure. Really. Yeah. Well, speaking of crazy compute, this one has, I know this is really recent, yeah. 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 From the space shuttle. Yeah. I don't have a lot of space shuttle stuff, but the thing that blows my mind about this is, uh, look at this, the electronics are wire wrapped yeah, underneath there. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, what? That is not a very reliable method. And not even backed up with solder in certain places. Like yeah. I can see some solder joints, but, but in some places, just the wire wrap. Exactly. Now to be fair, this is serial number one. And so I haven't yet done my research to find out, wait, was that maybe only for show number one when there may have been still like bench talk, tweaks and, and, and tests and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. maybe they did a potted, yeah. at least a potted version of the yeah. animal. Yeah, something more with this style. Yeah. Of it. Isn't this gorgeous? This is from Viking, yeah. just a power uh, distribution bus. Yeah. But, wow. Nice cable management. Right? Always very satisfying. Exactly. Some yeah. people might really get off on uh, <laughs> some Reddit. Set Reddit for that. And this is an, uh, an Apollo energy distribution. Was this be here in the past? This no. Uh, yeah. What no, is that? that is a J2 impeller. And wow. so in the turbo pumps of engines, there are works of art on the inside. Yeah. And this thing is spinning at very high speeds. Yeah. And, the, and the engineering challenge is how do I jam fuel and oxidizer into a combustion chamber that is itself at enormously high pressure? Yeah. And so people have been working on all kinds of different ways of solving this from having small rocket engines that power up mm -hmm. a turbine. To uh, I love the RL10 uses the phase change from liquid to gas to drive the turbo pumps mm. to jam the fuel in. And oh, then, and the volume change. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the volume. Yeah, the uh, physics the of a thousand liquid times, yeah. to gas expansion cycle yeah. jams it in. Wow. And then you have uh, some smaller rockets like Astra in the early days. Mm -hmm. Certainly, Rocket Lab in the early days thought we just use electric motors. The electric right. motors have got powerful enough. Yeah. If your rocket's small enough, yeah. that you can just jam it in there. Yeah. So that all. Uh, yeah. Wow. That all, uh, and it, it looks almost like a unibody part. That's amazing that yeah, even back then you could make, make that. Yeah. Oh, by the way, for a sense of scale, this is the F1, the Saturn V fuel and oxidizer lines. This is Incredible. how big they are. They're just pumping fuel, in. and wow. this is a spline from one of their electric too. Yeah, please do. But they had these flex flex lines. Yeah, yeah. These are couplers from the flex lines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then, 
I forget, did we talk about this before? This crazy Russian thing? I believe we have. Okay, yeah. let's skip it. It's just, if anyone wants Alma's periscope, we'll leave that as a exercise for the, uh, for the listener. <laughs> Transitioning from the shuttle, where we were talking about, you know, the, the IMU, which is, for those who don't know, the inertial measurement unit, it's kind of like your gyroscope. Something you take for granted that your phone, yeah, when you right. move it, it knows what angle you're at, it can sense the slightest motions. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, that was huge multi-million dollar machines with physical gyroscopes, you know, like in the case of the lunar module, one spinning one direction orthogonal to another. They only give you two axes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of motion detection, yeah. uh, versus they give six in your phone. But yeah. anyway, this is a fuel cell just, uh, I've only seen this in the California Science Center, and it's a fairly recent acquisition, the full fuel cell from the shuttle orbiter, um, uh, when they decommissioned it, they knew they would never be able to fire it up again. It's kind of sad, hmm. but the space shuttles all had liquid cooling running throughout the electronics arrays, yeah. and they knew that once they put them in a museum and stopped keeping the fluid flowing, kind of, it would seize up, it wouldn't flow again, therefore you wouldn't able to ever be able to turn them on, and therefore it was like a permanent shutdown forever of yeah, the electronics. one-way street, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I was invited to take photos of Shuttle Endeavour with all of its instrument panels lit up in the cockpit and the flight deck and mid-deck and, and in the bay to, to basically capture imagery for for the last time wow. of what it looked like when it was powered up. Yeah. And that's part of the kiosk display for the California Science Center for Endeavor. Very cool. And they've recently moved it from horizontal to vertical, the full stack. Really? Yeah. Well, they, they, it's, it's enormous and a massive construction project that's almost, sure. almost finished. Sure. You imagine the nervousness of like the engineers after so many years who are lifting it from that's horizontal right. to vertical. Woo. That's right. Some nail biting moments. <laughs> yeah. Like the one that was Oh, this, uh, the solar panel thing is slightly. Uh, uh, more interesting, there were four of these that folded down for the JPL Ranger that you know had a really hard time uh, <laughs> yeah, hitting, the hitting the target. <laughs> exactly. Well, I don't know what the analogy would be there, right, right in terms of scale, but I kind of imagine it's, it's it's a very easy one where you, you're trying That's to right. hit a tiny little target all the way from Earth, right? That's right. Yeah, they they uh, they mm -hmm. missed it. One, one of the first ones, I think, it was either number two or first attempt, mm -hmm. just missed the moon entirely, and so it's still in orbit around the sun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just um, like the roadster, right? <laughs> exactly. Now here are a bunch of cool things. Um, let me think how best, to, where best to start. So why don't we start with, how about these tools? Sure. So I only recently came to obtain an example of four of the different lunar surface tools. Basically, what were we using to collect moon rocks and samples on the lunar missions? It would mm -hmm. be ridiculous, right, for them to individually pick a problem. Right, right, exactly. So they, they, they had tools and they were, and they learned. So on Apollo 11, for example, they had a scoop that looked like this. Like a bucket. Mm -hmm. Like a bucket. And it would attach to various different lengths of, of, of uh, you know, connectors, if you will, right? Sure. So it's kind of screwed on. Yeah. Now, this one uh, was actually used by Neil Armstrong in training. Not on the moon, but on, on Earth. But by, literally, this was Neil Armstrong's. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at later missions, and I asked Charlie Duke at Apollo 16. He didn't recognize this at all. He's like, literally, I'd never what seen is that? it. Yeah. He's like, I, I don't know what that is. Because by Apollo 16, they would shifted to a, an interesting and different design, yeah. um, much smaller. They realized we don't really you don't need that use volume. a scoop yeah. for something that big. Yeah. And very importantly, they added this feature of many different, yeah, connect what? points. What? Right. And a be by the way, beautiful. Look at the machine. Uh, basically, yeah, the like you, can't even, you can't even tell. You can't even tell that this thing has been welded at any point. Oh, wow. Now this one is pretty special. This is in okay. some ways my most valuable artifact. This was used on the moon for three days on Apollo 16. So this is Charlie Duke. He, he brought it back as a souvenir. <laughs> kept it his entire life until this year that I bought it from him. He came here to the office and told us all kinds of stories of yeah. everything he remembered of its use. And um, in fact, I can show you briefly a photo of it being used. Yeah, we got to bring it over to compare to the uh, yeah, photo the evidence, right? Exactly. <laughs> and you can see the, the handle. So here is, yeah, I never really put it next to it. This is that. Yeah. In this, in that I ninety think, degree orientation. Yeah, exactly. Cause, and he, oh, because you could, you one of his many things he'd used it like an armrest. So he told the story that there's the largest moon rock ever collected mm -hmm. on the Apollo program was called the Muli. He named it after a guy named Mullenberger. And I kept asking him, why do you call why? it the Muli when yeah. it's Mullenberger? Why not the Muli? But no, it's the Muli, <laughs> and it's always been the Muli. Huge rock. Uh, in fact, the the new Lego lunar rover kit, which I have over there, actually recreated the Muli because they thought it was such an important thing. Yeah. But he said I could not lift it off the lunar surface. I had to use yep, that this as, leverage, yeah. as a lever yeah. to then roll the rock and so it wouldn't <laughs> fall over. I tried a few times, it didn't work. Roll the rock up my spacesuit to like a football hole. Yeah. Uh, and this was essential for that. It was also, of course, what they used to collect uh, samples all over the place. In the sure. So this was sure. used extensively. It was driven around the lunar rover 
for three days. Incredible. On the lunar surface. Incredible. And, you know, for a surface used artifact, that's the most rare of things. Sure. You know, like, sure. There's did, literally did the space? one. Yeah. <laughs> did it go to space? Rare. Yes. <laughs> did it go to the moon and back? More rare. Did it land on the moon? More rare still. Was it driven around the moon on an electric car? <laughs> the most rare. Yep. And then in cases like this and others, they brought back souvenirs. All of the astronauts did. From they detached pieces of the lunar module, mm -hmm. they brought back certain tools and mementos contrary to protocol, mm -hmm. and were left allowed to keep them and by law own them. Uh, it was an act of Congress in the Obama administration yeah. that clarified that little nuance, uh, yeah. nuance of gray area. Yeah. Uh, and so I have since collected a piece of every lunar module that's been on the moon. So literally a piece of the spacecraft. Wow. Um, and, then, and now some of the tools too. I wonder if that yeah. made uh, Houston nervous, you know, having to like drag a rock up your space suit. Oh, that part, yes. Right. I was like, I don't know. No. I'll have to go back and look at the transcript. Yeah. Maybe he may part later until the record he was done to say, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Do you, do you know roughly how heavy the, the rock Oh, we can look it up. Uh, it was, I don't know if it was 20 kilograms. It was, and everything is one sixth gravity. So what's okay. big for us is different. I know okay. that, it, like, I have a huge. Wow. Uh, I, I didn't even notice that earlier. Yeah, we that's a meteorite from, uh, from Vesta, asteroid Vesta. It's somewhere between that and the lunar rock that's right near it, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. This could be an interesting segue to this document, which I love. Um, I don't normally collect documents, but this one, and given my affinity for Apollo 16, is pretty special. It's the handwritten notes were done on the moon. All the smudges are moon dust. Um, and what they had to do at the end of the mission was, well, they first, for each of the different places, the different types of bags, yeah. What is the weight? They had a little scale yeah. that was adjusted for lunar gravity. Yeah. What is the weight of the this collection of rocks? Yeah. So they knew it was in each bag, yeah. right? Yeah. Then it's like a bin fitting problem. They had to fit this algorithm. They have to edge and cover, 40 pounds max. This particular area, 32 pounds max. So they had yeah. a series of constraints. Yeah, it's an optimization problem. It's a multivariate problem. optimization problem. Yeah. How do I put, so then they put like each of the numbers to, and I checked, and sure enough, they, they met all the criteria, but it's like a little math problem yeah. on the moon. And the you can do on the fly, yeah. And the reason they had to do that was for weight balancing, as we know sure. in our rockets. Sure. You don't want everything off on one side, so they had to do a distribution of yeah. weight yeah. Around, the, around the capsule. And EVA being extra. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like, like uh, basically car drive number one, two, and three, or, yeah. or in the earlier missions, anything outside of the vehicle, extra vehicular um, um, activity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, EVA. Very cool. Or moonwalk for short. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think that's one of the, <laughs> favorite documents that can be so we were talking about the uh, shovels right sure. so so yes. where does oh, this oh, piece yeah, come yeah, in yeah. yeah and this is a weird one i have to go i haven't yeah. done my research yet to like take dust off of something right so it's like same same articulating i i think if this one had been on the moon it would be a little darker in color huh? exactly <laughs> this, this one is not flown that's exactly right yeah. that's that's a pretty cool mechanism how yeah, like... neat? and you can see the teeth here on this one more easily Interestingly, yeah. this, this, these set of teeth have a disc. Yeah. They may have learned you don't want to get your little something snuck in it. So sure. Notice they've added a disc sure. in the flight version. It's incredible how it's just the same mechanism of these, like, you know, mm -hmm. rivets with a back yeah. spring that allows you to and attach you just and attach detach. Different, yeah. You know? So you, you go to tools. Harbor Freight or Home Depot, you buy one of your tools with one of those exactly. little rivet, rivets. Yeah. That's so cool. And then this one is a prototype built, so it's not the final flight version, but it's close <laughs> of, of the rake. And this is kind of, this is by Grumman. You can imagine this is like there's stuff in, Going to the, work. <laughs> in the dust regolith and you want to like scoop and sure. see what kind of shape. solid chunks come out, right? Sure. And there was a place on the back of the lunar module, actually it's funny, to use, a, uh, to use a Lego kit, which I recently bit, built as the example of this. But on the back of the lunar rover, they had, can you believe this, they reproduced the rake in Lego. There it is. <laughs> yes, exactly. And they reproduced that, not exactly the right scale, sure, but that, that same thing, and they put the hinge on it. Wow. And then they uh, get that back into its hole. Not every day you get to see a Lego yeah. replica and then the actual... Exactly. Unit. And they even open, there were other like drills and tools, but this was on the back of the... Um, Oh, and I mentioned the muley, right? So here's their representation for a sense of scale <laughs> yeah. compared to a person. Yeah. The, the, yeah. But again, <laughs> Lego sometimes is a little off because they have to make it fit. Sure. Legos. And probably not planned in terms of like where to stick the muley, right? So That's right. you got to figure out where to, where to place it. By the way, anyone who wants to build this, it's really cool. So it's got the you know, four-wheel steering so like cool. lunar rover. They all had separate electric motor in each one. In total, one horsepower. Total. Right. So <laughs> four quarter horsepower engine. It has suspension built in. But here's the part I didn't realize until I bought the kit. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do this for you, but if you pull some pins, this whole thing folds up into a tiny little wedge. The seats fold down, it, but just like the original lunar rover, because it had to fit in the descent stage wow. for landing, and then it lands on the surface and unfolds. So this whole thing folds up into like yeah. this tall, this wide. Yeah, kind of like yeah. in a triangular-ish structure. Or? Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. There was a, well, one of the bays on the descent 
stage had a, roughly a triangular space yeah. to fit in. That was the constraint. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Is this kind of like for the wheels that like is a mesh? Unique, yeah, a mesh looking mm -hmm. structure exactly. that deforms. It was like piano wire. Yeah. Uh, I think something coated with titanium, and then they had some plates for traction on the outer yeah. surface. But yeah, you don't need, need an inner tube. Oh, right. It's kind of a problem if you uh, blow wheel. a tube on the moon, right? <laughs> yeah. Those things worked amazingly well, as you know. Uh, incredible, yeah. incredible feats of the program. Yeah. So back to here, some other interesting stories. This is, uh, I recently got this. It's from the command module, Spare, but it shows you a number of the warning lights that would kick in. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous one, Bus B Undervolt. Mm -hmm. That's the light that went off and was on the transcript from Apollo 13 mm -hmm. when you know the solar, I mean, excuse me, when the fuel cell blew up, mm -hmm. or rather the oxygen tank that feeds the fuel cell. And they had all these errors, and this one was the one that was like, whoa, that doesn't normally fl get flagged. And then after Apollo 13, by the way, they removed, I, happened, I just recently got this too. This is a bus B, kind of like, imagine like in your yeah, car. Like, connect like you have like the batteries. Grounding or something, exactly. or, or maybe for the main terminal, yeah. Yeah, you know, this is, yeah, this is for bus B, see the bus bar for battery B. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the Apollo 13 one that was in the middle. It, it didn't actually fail, but it was in the middle of the drama. So after... So often a lot of the artifacts I get are something went wrong, yeah. then they removed the part, yep. they then got deassessed from the Apollo, Smithsonian, what have you, and was sent to a lab for special analysis, hmm. and then worked its way into the public hands yeah. through a different channel, because, yeah. you know, anyway, why yeah. would you have bothered to remove this from other spacecraft? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that idea of, like, root cause analysis, you weren't even there. You weren't even close to, you know, right. where the uh, event happened, and it, you have to the figure out the out materials, right. right, from a microscopic structure and attempt to... Uh, infer what happened is just incredible. So let me show you one other thing because it somehow reminds me of this. This will be a good seg. I'm, I'm making up segues as I go. Sure. <laughs> so uh, electrical issues. Yeah. So this, uh, the transition is electrical issues. Mm -hmm. This is the Apollo 11. At the time they just called it LM5 because when they were developing the various lunar modules, yeah. it wasn't certain which of the series of lunar modules in a row would end up going to the moon. Here's, right. here's a few reasons. LM1 was a test flight with no people. It went so well that they never flew LM2. LM2 is in the Smithsonian. Was, when it was supposed to be like It was going to be the, the second, update the second the, flight. Yeah. be like, okay, something was wrong in one, let's we'll fly two. Yeah. So two, that's the reason we have a complete lunar module in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. That's LM2. I happen to have the guidance computer from that, we, but we went over that in a prior mission. They gutted it for electronics, but yeah. they kept the shell. Uh, so they're going along, and oh, by the way, there was, as, as famously, that, oh, let's send Apollo 8 around the moon change up, right? So that, you know, no one would have guessed ahead of time that's the lunar module that's going to make the first flight around the moon, sure. because that was a late game time decision. Sure. Um, this then, in the course, this level 5 is for Eagle. So this is for the lunar module that we now call Eagle, the first land on the moon. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they had a day shift and a night shift in you know, 1968, Incredible. June. And you can read the handwriting, because every day the day shift had to leave notes for the night shift to read yeah. and understand had to be in, legible. In, in legible English <laughs> that uh, and when you look through this a few things jump out yeah. there is the vast majority of challenges they were wrestling with all related to batteries and electronics let me just see if I oh, I love this caution, caution for <laughs> entire weekend do not energize these circuit breakers uh, something other work being done and all these yeah, elements right done, yeah. then there will be diagrams and resistance uh, elements, uh, voltage levels, and jumpers. Pages and pages of writing, right? Uh, I don't know if I've, I've, I've held uh, yeah. or flipped a page from 1960-something. 1968, in yep. Incredible. So I've scanned, oh yeah, i got to be careful with this. I've, I've, uh, Nora, uh, thankfully, sitting mm -hmm. over there, has scanned every page of this in full digital resolution, and I've posted it online, of course, for free. Yep. So anyone who wants to read through this, oh, and, and for your listeners, yep. if any of you are related to these people. All we have is a first initial and a last name. <laughs> but if you're the child of, or happen to still be alive, uh, miraculously, from this time period, I'd love to connect with you and, and, and see if there's any memories you have. Yeah, any stories this from, yeah. element. I'm do, do, do you know where these like little sticky note uh, comments Oh, that was, someone, that was a prior owner okay. who used this to write a book. Um, oh, so I bought okay. this from an author. I have another uh, binder of it. Uh, so let me show you one last thing. I, I, uh, can't, some of them have circuit diagrams. Yeah, we could spend a whole video just on probably what's exactly. in here, right? But there's one cool page towards the end, the equivalent of a PowerPoint presentation at Grumman, LM Phase 3, November 1968, where there's a big exclamation point, and George Lowe says, this is very likely to be the lunar module with the land on the moon. It should be. So it's not until, like, then, right? Think about that. That's, like, not, I mean, this is, like, 
roughly a half year from actually landing on the moon that they finally figured out that this thing that they've all been working on is yeah. going to be that famous machine. That's an incredible cadence to go from a comet like this to, to actually landing on the moon in right. six months. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing I put, because I'm, I'm a geek, I entered every date and time into a spreadsheet. spreadsheet yeah. to and see, like, I reverse in, well, just analyzed what the work schedule was like. And yeah. they basically worked every weekend straight through, uh, but they did take off like five days for the 4th of July. So there was like one big break. Yeah. Oh, and the other crazy thing, I, I entered the names. The, this, I guess they inherited from the Navy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they went through an insane continuous shift between day shift and night shift. So in other words, someone was on the day shift, like every four or five weeks, they'd shift to the night shift and back and oh. forth and back and forth. Like, I think to share the pain, yeah. but it also doesn't seem optimal. Yeah, I mean, I would have no, thought, absolutely. crash program, let's have a separate day shift, separate yeah. night shift, let's yeah. not do all these time zone changes. Yeah. Um, but yeah. they, they didn't. That must be very hard on the, like, psych, you know, your physiology, right? Oh, after, yeah. after months and months and months of switching back and forth. Now here's something I had received, but I haven't even opened yet. So this is the tag, uh, Lunar Module Hemix. Um, so you'll be the first with me to see what this unfolds to. Um, so in the Lunar Module, you had to sleep especially in the J missions, where you, uh, the later missions that is, oh. the last three, we are on the moon for three days. So this is, interestingly, lots of Velcro still. Oh, and uh, interesting connection. Yeah, so they would connect to hard points in the LEM, mm -hmm. in the lunar module, mm -hmm. and uh, interesting, this is just like a, you know, the- uh, Yeah, a ratchet. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, so anyone who's been the REI recognizes those. Um, the same beta cloth that uh, is used throughout, you know, basically the, the PLSS covers and the spacesuits. Oh yeah. And so this is basically like a sleeping mat. So yeah, a sleeping uh, like hammock. Yeah, hammock. Yeah. Oh, let me see. Is this? Oh no. So I don't know what. I'm assuming some sort of. They don't have the off the mating part for the Velcro. So I'm guessing there's another piece that's not this that you put over to keep yourself from you know, floating off. Sure. Right. Because you you have one six. Oh, actually, sorry. Would you have been in? No, you wouldn't have been in zero gravity except for Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. So on the moon, you had one six gravity, so you still have some. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But. Uh, but there's obviously something that this attached to. I'm not sure, sure. what that was. Maybe a blanket, keep you warm. I don't know what the temperature was. Sure. Well, I'm gonna have to, obviously, I need to do more research before I randomly <laughs> pontificate on something that I haven't researched yet. Which reminds me, you know, for everything that we're seeing here today, yeah. I try to do as much research as I can, find people who know something about it. So any viewers who have stories about the hammock, please, yeah. please share them and then uh, add that to the, um, to the postings I make on Flickr. And, yeah. Now it's on WordPress too. It's just like small details are just incredible, right? Like, like the degrees mm -hmm. of motion that are enabled by this type of a joint. Oh yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah two, two a uh, yeah, yeah, instead of a ball joint. Yeah, probably more reliable. Here, I'll, <laughs> I'll fold this back up. Sure. Then I'll do one other thing that's on the table, which, to my knowledge, has not been shared anywhere. Certainly, no one has seen it by video. Uh, Can't um, wait for that. Yes, <laughs> and that is these items. So these are, I can show you, you know, hold that, the translational hand controller, meaning the thing that, translation as you might imagine, fine motor control, if mm -hmm. you will, for the engines and the RCS systems for docking mm -hmm. of the command module to the lunar module. And this is And this is like, like on? Well, I'll tell you yeah. what it is in a moment. Okay. This is the, <laughs> the other, the rotational controller, which is, it has a it, the trigger is not for firing a missile, it's for communications, um, but it looks like a joystick, yeah. and that's for more course control, like let's rotate the entire spacecraft, or, command module, right, mm -hmm. and, and service module around so that we can dock with the lunar module and, you know, big mm -hmm. things. But these are, just at a distance, you can see them on the far left seat. Yeah. There's one on the left side, and then this guy, rotational control on the right side. Yeah. On Apollo 11, that's where Neil Armstrong would have been sitting, yeah. and here's the best part for us. These are the 11, Apollo 11, um, wow. Grips, yeah. For can I take a look at the uh, yeah, joystick? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, Here, I'll, I'll keep it right. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. And, the, and the removal tag, as well. So temporary. Neil Armstrong literally is holding. It's a temporary parts tag, right? There is a removal tag. It's <laughs> exactly. got to go back. <laughs> exactly. That just hasn't happened. Um, there's a story behind that. Long story, but like, why does this exist outside? Because yeah. on all the com um, command modules, they've uh, put replacement spares, if you will, and, and alternatives on from the flown parts. Uh, even the external handle, which I think we talked about last time, yeah. all those were destroyed yeah. as radioactive waste, except yeah. for the one that I have yeah. here. Yeah. I mean, it's a little hard to see, but even on the duct tape, there, it's labeled Apollo 11. 
Whether or not that's from the mission oh, itself. Wow. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, uh, that I've seen this. Post. This has gone through auction a couple times before I finally uh, bought it and reunited it with its, with its sister. Although I could see yeah. this being, you know, 50 year old duct tape. Mm-hmm. Oh, at the time of removal. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm doubting it because I have photos oh, of I it. Oh, I see. I see. Literally, uh, you know, they do these checkout photos before and after the flight. Sure. Uh, but I think it was added at removal. So at the right. time, but right. not, not during the flight itself. Sure. Incredible. And then just a reminder, that we'll just quickly show the couch again. I, think, I know you covered it before, but just as a reminder, remember Neil Armstrong is sitting here and on takeoff, this just should, these, now you can see like how these things move, right? Exactly. So again, this is for the fine control, but on takeoff, he has his hand on this as well. And the reason is it has one extra feature or function. Pull. If you do this, that's the abort. That motion alone. Just that. Yep. You can go back. You can. That motion alone will trigger the solid engines up on the, you know, escape tower that pulls the entire command module away from, let's say the rocket's exploding and in a way to safety, right? And so the parachute's This is out. like less than five pounds to spin this. Yep. So enforced. think about the steely-eyed missile man, or they yep. call them, right? You're like, things are going, yep. you're like jittering, right? <laughs> so on Apollo 12, they got hit twice by lightning and the entire control deck went out, right? And they did a hard read with, they had to do this SCE to AUX, you know, flip that someone in Mission Control would remember to get it to reboot. But basically fuel cells were out, batteries were out, Everything was freaking out. Every alarm that it could go was sure. Sort of, like, sure. So from a just visual perspective, yeah. right, everything's just gone right. completely. Things are going downhill. But it felt okay, yeah. right? Because this analog flight computer uh, continued. It's in a ring way down the rocket. It was not impacted at all by lightning strike. Like isolated in some yeah. weird so way. Yeah. So there's this thing called the instrument unit. This ring with an IBM front end, and then this this analog part was directly controlling all the flight surfaces. And it, I'm going to take. It open at some point. It's just beautiful inside. It uh, is an analog computer, yeah. and it kept the mission going on Apollo 12, so that they didn't have to twist the handle and, and do an abort. Wow! Yeah. Can you imagine the uh, the nerves and the decision making going on of like everything is hitting the fan, right? Yes. Would we'll use a different word, but here, but mm-hmm. everything's hitting the fan, and then you decide not to abort. Yes. Right. Exactly. Incredible. And you get your hands on there the whole time. And you're like, should I? Should I not? Right. That's right. Yeah. And something no one has ever shown you in in um, and none of the simulations or preparation work was like, oh yeah, it might happen if we were hit by lightning that everything would flip out. It's like, you have no idea what just happened. And it wasn't fully understood in ways that we now understand a couple things that the plasma of the Saturn V is itself a conductor yeah. for lightning. Right. So it's like a big right. lightning rod. Right. And the, it wasn't much speed at this point, but the, 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 know, the active pushing it actually compresses that it, when you get closer to the clouds. Right, increasing that, the density. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. So there was a fairly important SpaceX launch that was called, oh yeah, the first launch of humans. Uh-huh. It was delayed by three days. It was right on the edge of, there's no lightning, there's no rain, but that but this the, calculation, they have all these sensors around of like, to what extent is a lightning strike looking imminent? And the idea would be that as it's pulling through the clouds, it would compress and just trigger. Oh, and it, yeah, 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 yeah. It like forms its own local weather in some way, mm-hmm. like an extreme wildfire might, right? Like. Uh, yeah, well, in this case, I think it's your earlier point about the bow shockwave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, huh. But back then, they didn't have the same uh, lightning towers also. They, like we learned, let's put up big, and every, every launch you see now, you see these four enormous towers, much higher than the rocket itself mm-hmm. at, when it's at rest, that are meant to absorb lightning strikes in that brief moment when the flame is still, in a sense, contact with the ground once it's lifted up. Yeah. That was no longer a problem. It's only then the compression as you get faster. But anyway. Wow. So. So let's, uh, that's such like a, a small detail that, that has such a large impact, right? That it's, of course, in hindsight, it's like, yeah, that's, all, that's obviously going to be an issue. But in foresight, who would, who would have thought, right? Who would have thought? So the couple of flown things since you were last year uh-huh. that are personal interests. So uh, my, both my parents are from Estonia. To my knowledge, this on this, this SpaceX uh, flight is the first and only Estonian flag that's, that's ever flag. gone into orbit. Yep. What? Now, there's something... Somewhat analogous in that, let me show you one brief side thing. It's not a flag, but on Apollo 11, uh, Buzz Aldrin left a silicon disc on the moon. And I'll bring it over for you guys to see. So in 1969, this was the state of the art in some years. Remember I was saying earlier that, you know, they were the, the you know, yeah, the, the, size of the, one, the one inch diameter, two yeah. inch diameter is a lot more on this. And it might be hard to see, but yeah. inside the ring, there's a lot of little square yep. regions. Chi- it looks almost like little chips, like two-dimensional exactly. prints of a chip. Exactly. So they're made in the same method. In fact, 
the company that did this spray got a patent uh -huh. on that, which is they use the polysilicon on, on silicon and the refractive index difference to eventually put writing. So it's like microfiche. You have small miniaturized writing. Uh -huh. So what they did is they solicited letters from all the world leaders, with the exception of Russia, because Russia's horrible, and, um, <laughs> and, and it always has been. Yeah. Uh, and they uh, literally got them physical paper letters or fax, yeah. and I think it was all paper actually. Yeah. And then they would miniaturize it. Trend, they would image that yeah. and miniaturize it down yeah. there. So yeah. that includes a letter from the Pope, that's the most ornate, from Haile Selassie of, of Ethiopia, yeah. from Indra Gandhi of India, and from the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, even though they were part of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. the US at that time did not recognize that the Soviet Union actually owned them because yeah. eventually they'll be free again. Yeah. And they were right. Yeah. And so they have letters from the consulate of those three yeah. that are also on there. So, so there's, Estonia, not, there's, there's no flag, yeah. <laughs> but there's a letter from Estonia yeah. Yeah. on the moon. I mean, it really does look like miniature uh, two-dimensional chips, but they're just mm -hmm. miniaturized letters. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And it says, yeah, and it says from planet Earth, July 1969 on there, if, if, if it didn't show up on the camera. Exactly. Wow. I, I, can, I can give you some links uh, if you want. To read the, the show yeah, notes, if you will. Yeah. To, uh, <laughs> to, I'll just put that there for now. So then, other flun things, I happen to be wearing one. So, this watch has been in space. Um, I, you I might feel notice. Like I do recognize the, the watch. I've seen exactly. it somewhere. Yeah. So, there's going to be a new set of these coming up for auction the uh, charity auction for St. Jude. But Jared, um, yeah, Jared, yeah, yeah exactly. who flew the first all civilian, yes. non NASA related yep. flight, it was yep. called Inspiration Four, yep. uh, right there. Yep. Uh, this is his watch. So he had it, you know, he's wearing it, he's taking photos in exactly space right. of himself yeah, wearing yeah, 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 yeah. it. And uh, I think it's wonderful. It's this first sort of, what will hopefully be the first of many um, yeah. you know, sort of fully totally civilian flights. You see it on, you know, like the uh, promotional videos, right? And, mm -hmm. and him, he's wearing his watch, and then here it is, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I think the commander's watch would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. By the way, on Tuesday, well, if you're reviewing this later, who knows? Tuesday, uh, August 26th, yes. is the current scheduled date for him to fly again yeah. with a different crew of three, two yeah. SpaceX employees and then another uh, lady. Yeah. And they're going to go farther out. And the, the basically, it'll be the farthest Earth orbit yeah. that we've ever had. With so people, the yeah. only time people have gone farther is when they left Earth and went to the moon. Oh, okay, right. So this is higher than Gemini 11, which was the former record setting for most elliptical and highest flight. Yeah. So they're going to see Earth. Like, very, like no one's seen it yeah. since and, Apollo. And at Apogee, right? Like their relative motion is going to be so slow too. Exactly. Right? It's gonna be, so and they're, they're going to capture a mm -hmm. lot of photos, right? So, oh, and they're going to do the first spacewalk uh, of an all civilian crew, which is, uh, in fact, no one's done a spacewalk around the moon. Uh, they have done it on the way back from the moon. But this will be pretty amazing to be like in a spacesuit, looking at Earth from higher up than anyone's been since Apollo. Yeah. And certainly higher up than anyone's been in orbit. Um, so that's yeah. exciting. And yeah. then there's another um, one later in the year. Some crypto guy is going to fly over the North and South Pole, again with four people. Right. Never been done before. It's right. rotating like this. Right. And, you know, it takes so a lot of Delta V to change your orbit plane. Exactly. Right? Normally you would never do that. Yeah. The closest anyone's come before was the first uh, woman in space uh, uh, from Russia. Wow. She was in a, an inclination. It was close to. Okay. Close to, but not quite. Uh, the poles. Do you know what type of rocket? Uh, it, it, sure, it, it's SpaceX, probably, oh, right? Yeah. But, but like, what configuration? Maybe is it just a standard oh, Falcon Nine? Maybe? I think it's a standard Falcon Nine yeah. and a Dragon. Space, yeah, right. So you might you need no. They're not, yeah, you don't they're need they're the extra. Doing, I'm pretty sure they're not doing the Falcon Heavy. Yeah. So Falcon Nine, and I, what's also interesting is they, because of the configuration for crew and everything, they're going to do Cape Canaveral yeah. Yeah. instead of Vandenberg because it's easier from Vandenberg to get into that orbit because you can go opposite Earth's rotation and sort of undo the fact that you're sort of spinning. Sure. Whereas in Kennedy Space Center, when you take off, you're sort of using Earth's horizontal to put you in an equatorial orbit more easily than sure. a polar orbit. Sure, right. So it's actually, you're, it's, it's not ideal. Hmm. But there's still enough you know, budget, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it turns out Dragon's not the heaviest of payloads. Um, now that they've improved I wonder what, Falcon 9. I wonder what the landing like dispersion looks like, right? Because usually, mm -hmm. you know, the teams are used to uh, equatorial type oh, right. dispersion right. patterns. Point. When like, you're coming uh, back. Guess what? Maybe you'll land in, I don't know, Brazil yep. or, or something, right? Well, that's a very good question. Like, would they still go for Gulf of Mexico or right. where are they? Because, I, of, I because of the direction mm -hmm. you're orbiting. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So if you're off or, or early, right. you don't want to be hitting, <laughs> in, hitting Brazil or something. Right, yep. exactly. <laughs> yeah, so that'll be, that'll be new views. Let's see here. Why don't we go briefly in here, because there may be a few things you haven't seen sure. before. We'll have a reminder that this is the, yep. the SpaceX channel from the first human flight. So yep. that's, that was one we were referencing earlier yep. that got delayed for uh, lightning risk. Yep. Incredible. I don't know if we had this here before. I don't think we have. I don't think so. Um, it also, we were using it as a, um, 
with a glass top as a uh, kind of like an entry table within your standard room. So put in here. So it's there would normally be a big body, <laughs> sure. a single body between those cone and fin cam. Yep. But it's both from the Airb 150, and this is a sustainer engine from it as well. These were sounding rockets. These were rockets that you know go way back, and a lot of them were launched for a variety of experiments, as you know well. Yep. Um, the, put out chaff and measure, let's say, yeah. that can you be seen by radar. Yeah. Trying to explore what goes on up there, yeah. if you will, when you release things or, or yeah. whatever. And this one, this one is scorched in an interesting way. I'm not yeah. sure if that's from flight or, or just bad storage. It's not obvious to me. Um, yeah. yeah. Beautiful patterns. Isn't it? It's yeah. Good. Achtung. Yeah. Then uh, we're here. I don't know if I talked about this last time, but back to solar panels. Another one of these beautiful arrays, yeah. 1966, so yeah. one inch wafers again. Yeah. Uh, this model reminds you of what it came from. It would have been the spare from one of those four panels. Wow. And these antenna, the high gain antenna and low gain antenna, I actually have on the ceiling spares of those two. <laughs> they're hard to see because they're white on white, but there's the high gain antenna there and the low gain. And while you're looking up, this photo is a reminder of what it was meant to do. There's all these vertical strips in the photo because as yeah. this thing was orbiting the moon, he was taking continuous film, and this was long before digital cameras. So how do you get that film back when returning the spacecraft is risky and expensive? Mm -hmm. You have an analog film lab, a dark room, like in the old days of film, develop the film, rolls the film, and then have a video camera with a 5 micron beam, what? image image to the photo, and all send on board. back. All, all on board. So all within this spacecraft, you know, wide angle and telephoto lens, it's a film lab inside that silver canister, and then they would beam it back. Incredible. And that's how we got high resolution images for uh, planning the, the landing sites for Apollo, like where are the least rocks. Um, it turns out the resolution wasn't good enough that Apollo 11, when they actually got there, like, oh crap, there's boulders <laughs> just below the resolution limit of what they could do. Wow. And so that's when Neil Armstrong had to famously take over. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Slightly like, different off the bottom pilot, let me... Uh, exactly. Yeah. It, was, it was limits of imaging. Yeah. And back in the 60s, when they were taking these images, they would release them. Oh shit, I put it back in my office, but I have examples of all the photos they released to the public all of which were down resolved at the time. So they would yeah. take a photo of the photo to make the Russians think our spy satellites weren't as good as they really were. Yeah. Because we right. really could do amazing things. In fact, this engine was uh, from the Agena, but also was used to, uh, the same exact setup was used for the Corona um, program. I always wondered, why did we build this bizarre spacecraft whose only job was a docking target in the Gemini missions, like mm -hmm. it seems like a lot just for yeah. like, you could have had two Gemini craft dock. Like why why build a special yeah, separate? Yeah. Turns out there was a whole other use case for it that we didn't admit at all at the time, yeah. which was uh, spice satellites. Yeah. Um, but it's really crude. I mean, yep. you can see. I mean, it, it looks like, like someone like, just went to their backyard with a TIG welder or something and you know hacked it together. Yeah, it does not have the same quality as those surface lunar tools. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Um, I mean, and look, and look the. Hydraulics. It looks yeah. crazy. Yeah. Right, for, these are the you know the actuators for. Yeah. Looks like someone grabbed this off the off of like a forklift or something. You know. Yeah. It's it's been banged up or something straight out of Aliens. You know, when Ripley's in that <laughs> power loader and it's like yelling. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, you have a little bit of the new stuff. Oh right? yeah, yeah, the up and coming. It's a reminder, and then a Starlink uh, terminal. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, and this is nice. This I think was. Uh, like 2017, thank you. This is from Kimball, thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. I forget what happened right that day. It may have been the reuse, like the first time landing and landing. I'll have to go back and look at why this mission was very special. I, I should have it memorized, but I, and I don't. Um, this, just while we're on this side of it, is, oh, careful. Uh, one of the panels that would be in the service module, so below the command module, you can see it's somewhat yeah, got a circular outer shape. Yeah. Yeah. On the other side would be like that engine you went the twang on, yeah. the, R, the R4D. Yeah. You'd have the quads of these reaction control systems. Yeah. And these are the fuel tanks to feed that. So basically the plumbing and for, for basically the propulsion system that allowed for, you know, <laughs> not the big engine, but the small local movements and yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, I can show you the big engine. I have an SPS engine over there, which sure. is the big guy that gets you back from the moon. This is for, you know, make sure you're pointing in the right direction. Sure. Um, I had no idea what to expect in terms of, let's say, what's the burst pressure of a uh, you know, fuel tank like this that, it tell you? that flies, but yeah, I mean, burst pressure 460 PSI. Interesting. Yeah. And, and, maximum, and then the max operating 248. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maximum working pressure, WD. Interesting. And it's been, it's been tested the three, that's all, it's all interesting that's on the tank. It's been tested yeah. the 360. Yeah. It'll explode at 460. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. All the insulation too. Right? Yeah. 
So it was a panel adjacent to one of these that blew out on Apollo 13 when the oxygen tank. Oh, actually, that's why I knew I put the fuel cell there. This is an Apollo fuel cell, just to show you what it looked like. It was the first Baker cell or alkaline fuel cell um, really used anywhere. It has 31 proton exchange membranes in that central tank, and this has the job of combining um, oxygen and hydrogen to generate electricity, about 1,600 watts continuous power, um, if I recall. It's like a, a hair dryer. Exactly, just like a hair dryer. For the viewers. <laughs> Bingo, yeah, running continuously. Think of that as a hair dryer. <laughs> so, they had, so they had three of them, so three of these in total, yeah. and the power needs, of course, were much more bursty, so you had a whole battery system yeah. to accumulate, you know, charge up, charge, then yeah. do something, and so that was part of the electrical complication. It was like, it was like a black art, making batteries work yeah. in all those harsh so conditions. You, another multivariate optimization problem. Insane, right? right. Yeah. Oh, and its only waste products were water, which they used to uh, hydrate their food, yeah. and heat, which they used to warm the vehicle. So it's yep. kind of a beautiful Every little, sustainability. Yeah. Element. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, wow. Then let's go. Let me show you. We'll do. Um, I think we. There's something else we didn't cover last time. I mean, maybe just to get sure. a quick glimpse, just because it's incredible, right? Like a slice of the moon. Oh yeah, <laughs> might as well look at that. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and the other, we can see the other side of the. This would be the exterior-facing side of that, and they put kept on um, insulin. That sort of, you know, that gold and yeah. ubiquitous gold things. Yeah, especially for module? maybe for viewers yeah. like when you have 3D printers, you, you sometimes might use kept on tape. Right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. I have rolls of it just for you know random stuff. Yeah. Uh, they had it, but interestingly, on the command module and the surface module, it was gold side down. So you, if you look at photos of them, like I can show you a photo of you know any of the like command module you know in orbit or out by the moon, it's very silvery looking. Mm -hmm. And I have the Apollo six, a big section of Apollo sixteen, the Captain uh, film. It's like, what was all that gold? It's like it was the other way around. The way the heat ah. radiation went, you you didn't want you wanted the silver radiating it outward. Huh. Um, slight, oh, at the time, I think there may have been a bigger but uglier moon rock that's been found <laughs> since. But at the time that I put the placard together, it was the largest. Um, uh, slice. Basically bigger than anything. Oh, thanks for the question. This was bigger than Muley. Um, oh, in, in size. Yeah. yeah. So Muley, uh, I just realized there was some Lego exaggeration. So that tells me Muley must have been about this big. Sure. Right. Just from the density it, of the rock. Because this thing is about that big. Yeah. Just yeah. from the density of the rock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's just gorgeous. That that uh, white and gray yeah. matrix the is what most yeah. of the moon is made of. Yeah. And the speckles are little metal that are high pressure infusions from a metal meteorite hitting the moon. Because it's just, as you can tell when you look at the craters, it's been bombarded, right? Sure. And it doesn't have any wind or rain or rivers to wash, or tectonic plates to get rid of that. Yeah. So it's sort of like a little time capsule yeah. of when it blopped off the Earth about 100 million years after Earth formed. Yeah, yeah. incredible. Yeah. Then, uh, why don't we, because I know we covered all this stuff. Remember this stuff, yes. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So we'll buzz by that, and I'll show you something new in my office. So we were talking about the X-15 earlier. Yeah. This is fastest that. human exactly. you know, flight vehicle. So I love this. this. This I find humorous. I have this little photo. I don't usually do photos, but it says to Steve Neil Armstrong <laughs> getting into an X-15. Because the X-15 started using those jet engines. It was hanging on the bottom of a large, I think, bomber, basically a very you know, large plane. Yeah. And it would drop and fire its engine. Yeah. The reason I love this is it was up for auction. This was before I was born, right? <laughs> so this is some other Steve. But when I saw oh, it, what? <laughs> when I saw it up for auction, like, it, you know. It was meant to be. It was meant to be, right. Um, this, this is a cool gathering of signatures that I did for SpaceX, basically mm -hmm. in 2012. Much earlier a, version, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, it, yeah, exactly. It's, it's got the tic-tac-toe arrangement. Yeah. So this flight that you see in the photo was the first time SpaceX successfully connected to the International Space Station, which was a huge accomplishment for the whole idea of commercial cargo, commercial crew to come, yeah. and was a big validation for a bet a bunch of people made that says we should give commercial space a chance. Yeah. And also in part, start relying on Russia. Right, start relying on Russia, right. Yeah. Russia was jacking up the price. That came for crew later, but this part on, on cargo would be like, hmm, I think we can get a cheaper deal. And so <laughs> I'm now reading this book called Reentry, which I highly recommend by Eric Berger. It'll come out on September 24th. Uh, it's talking about, like, at the time, the decision to even give SpaceX a chance, without which Probably we and very few groups would have invested in them. The idea that says you can actually do a, a big contract for NASA. If you deliver, there's $1.6 billion of business, mm -hmm. which is much cheaper than anything else out there. If you can do it, we'll, we will buy that. that. That's what helped convince us to invest. Mm -hmm. At the time though, before they got that award, it was not at all obvious they would. Boeing was the obvious contender. Like, and I'm reading like the actual dialogue of the people involved. They had a vote going on. Everyone said Boeing, just, just do Boeing. We only yeah. have enough budget for one. Yeah. And Boeing strategically 
estimated their cost to build uh, Starliner is exactly what was available in the budget. You yeah. eat it all up, no room for anyone else. Sure. And so uh, everyone was like, this. And to make a long story short, they, they, they really barely did it and went out on a limb, asked for more budget from the government, and had two competitors. Yeah. Right? As we know, Starliner is currently at station trying to figure out what to do. Yep. Um, several years late, spent more than twice as much as yep. SpaceX did. Yep. And SpaceX has launched tons of times. So, back to 2012, before any of this was proven. This is the first hint that maybe uh, things are going well. Yep. Uh, there was a 60 Minutes episode, and it's the only time I've seen Neil Armstrong cry. Uh, and he's being reminded of a testimony that Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan, mm -hmm. the first and last person on the moon, mm -hmm. given in Congress saying that we should, in, if I wave my hands, the high level bit was, this is dangerous, safety, blah, 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 we shouldn't bet on commercial, basically criticizing. It seemed, even though they didn't say SpaceX, it seemed like they're criticizing SpaceX. Yeah. And the way the 60 Minutes did it, they made it sound like that's what was happening. That was a narrative, And he yeah. was like, God, I wish they'd just come visit and like see what we're doing here, yeah. and like these are our heroes. And so sure. I, knew, I, I think I actually know the 60 Minutes, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's a very yeah. famous clip. Yeah. And so I knew immediately what to do, because I literally was buying artifacts from Gene Cernan Directly, I knew his EA, his assistant, and like I'm emailing him to buy a clip from Apollo 10. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, let me first see if I can get him to come to SpaceX to do exactly what Elon asked. Sure. And he, you know, he's curmudgeonly, he's pretty curmudgeonly. I'm like, no, no, I don't want to do that. And then I thought of this idea. Let me go and first get uh, congratulations from all the other astronauts. So this is like all the Apollo programs. I started with Buzz Aldrin, because he's the easiest. <laughs> congratulations. Um, Al Bean was the most thoughtful. He put a lot of work into this. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, the most amazing to me was Dave Scott said, the first leap of many giant steps to Mars. Hey. So think about this. Like 12 years ago, the Paul astronauts are saying SpaceX yeah. is a leap to Mars. Yeah. Like, I thought that was amazing. So yeah. I finally ended up with Gene Cernan. He was the last one I went to. And he was going to write, you know, well done, now the hard work begins. And I'm like, you know, the whole point here, because this is the, the prototype. I have a much larger version of this that's hanging at SpaceX. Mm -hmm. But I had two made at the same time. Mm -hmm. So a test run with their signatures, then the real one. So my, I got the test run. <laughs> I kept the test one, uh, and I gave Elon and SpaceX the other one. Yeah. Um, anyway, so finally got him to agree to write something, you know, like don't write anything at all, I'll write something nice. Sure. Because it's meant for the employees. <laughs> and then he started asking questions, and he sort of warmed up. By the end, when I told him that Elon put the first hundred million of his own money in before anyone else would, and he said, really? He said, the press should say, talk about that. Why, don't, why doesn't the press talk about that? Yeah. And so I could tell his mind was shifting. Yeah. He's so he was blaming look. the press yeah. for what he thought before, yeah. you know, and, uh, yeah. and so I thought that was... I, it's, it's the artifact in some ways I'm most proud of because I helped create it and it still hangs to this day sure, sure. at the front entry into the headquarters at, at sure. SpaceX. All the employees that are building the rockets see it. Sure. You know? Right. That's interesting with like the, the facts of the story that the, the perspective that someone might hold will, will change. Right? Yeah. Like you're against something but oh it turns out the story is a little bit different. That's that what you thought. Is it, there was a struggle by someone right? Mm -hmm. Elon and yeah. Yeah, Hero's journey. yeah exactly. <laughs> wow. So that's, that's fun. I recently got this too. Apollo 11 flown page that as they're coming over <laughs> it's just interesting from a photography point of view. They're like, okay, here are the different angles at which we want to take photos yeah. and basically the exposure settings and such for getting the, the right sort of last image of the landing site mm. so that you can tell from shadow and angle, like, okay, does, yeah. it, does it look like there are no surprises, yeah. um, if you will. Yeah. Um, recently had this print made on metal from John Cross. Highly recommend his photos. That's a, Love it. one of, I think, the two or three Falcon Heavies ago, and, and the effort it takes to get that alignment, right. to plan ahead, okay, moon's gonna be here, mm -hmm. I gotta set my camera up here, because that thing, by the way, gets by the moon very quickly, Sure, right? It's not like you can just do it manually right. and, and figure it out. Incredible. Um, okay, you asked about moon and stuff. Yes. Um, we'll so always love looking at so, uh, I don't know if we, rocks. I don't know if we held a big, big moon rock last time. This is oh. probably bigger than Malik. I'll have to check. Um, yeah, yeah, that idea of rolling it yeah. up. Not, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, You're rolling it up. <laughs> for those who aren't familiar, you know, the only way you could legally own moon rock in America is if it's a meteorite, meaning it's not the Apollo program. Um, and uh, wow. and they land everywhere on Earth, but we don't know. We can't really tell from a distance because like, yeah. it's just a rock. Yeah. And so you need to find them places where you have a high suspicion it's a meteorite, like yeah. the Sahara Desert. Because you can't analyze every rock. You can't, exactly. Yeah. And there's no like distance analysis. You have to like take a physical sample yeah. and uh, send it in to look at the oxygen isotope ratios and a bunch of other isotope ratios to figure it out. So this one, for example, it's been sliced off here, yeah. then sent for analysis to yeah. prove that it's from our moon. So from the isotope, uh, isotope perspective, where does that come into play versus what isotopes you might see on, on Earth? Great question. So for every, uh, there are different ones you look at. 
But for uh, the oxygen fractionation line, which is the most common one, this oxygen 16 to 17 ratio, yeah. it's really fascinating why this is the case. But like whenever you have like, let's say a body of water, like the ocean, yeah. some amount will evaporate. There'll be a slight difference the rate at which the slightly heavier isotope stays we'll behind say, and the yeah. lighter one is more volatile. Sure. So you get these lines that say, let, let me look at this ratio uh, of the two mm -hmm. uh, and, and plot it. And, and basically you get these lines that are consistent for different bodies. Every moon and um, planet that, we've, that we measured this for is different with the exception of our moon and Earth. It's part of the evidence that our moon was created from an impact 100 million years after huh. Earth's formation that remelted Earth yeah. and yeah. Produced, produced the moon. Yeah. In fact, recently, uh, in a reanalysis, I think it was a Apollo 17 sample, they found Earth meteorites embedded within uh, lunar rock. What? So a piece of Earth that got jettisoned off. Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. But then there's a bunch of other ones you can look at. Argon ratios. Yeah. Then you can also look at cosmic ray exposure. This, okay, this is a cool thing you do for the moon. So because the moon doesn't really have an atmosphere, I mean, it's so tiny, it's not worth talking about. Yeah. Um, if a moon rock like this was just sitting on the surface, for a few hundred million years. Yeah, the it will accumulate these little, yeah. these little hydrogen bubbles um, from alpha particles on the parts that are exposed, not on one side that was facing down. Uh -huh. If it was deep down for some period of time, it's not seeing any of it. Uh -huh. And if it's tumbling in space, yeah. having been it'll just be rather equal. equal, it'll be equal. Yeah. So you can look at the, you know, one side's less than the others. The, that amount tells you how much it was in space. Yeah. Then you can look at the others to figure out that, that's how long it was sitting on the surface. Wow. Because again, the moon's getting pulverized and eventually, uh, again, in case people are wondering how did it get to Earth, something hit the moon, another meteorite impact hits the moon, yeah. dislodges local rock yeah. that escapes the gravity well, yeah. and of all possible places it could end up, ends up yeah. landing in the Sahara Desert. Yeah. I mean, the, the idea, and, and is this the, uh, if I recall, the Martian rock? That's Mars. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so that's the do you want to do another thing. Mars? Here's a different Mars. The same thing will This is a new Mars, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, for, from Mars, just from a distance perspective, for some, yes, a, a meteorite to hit Mars and then some of that uh, escaped eject uh, from the gravity right. well to make it all the way back to Earth. It's right? insane to think about. In yeah. all the directions it could go. And, uh, and we think a large number of the Martian meteorites came from one massive impactor that went right, like and then different, sort of a, mm -hmm. yeah. And then different rocks have landed at different times. Right, because right, probabilistically, what are the chances that you have multiple collisions that lead to That's right. the band actually exactly. hitting us? Yeah. Exactly. So there's, oh, but actually, I normally don't have this at work. I brought it in because I want to do a little ex, uh, a little post of I'm just the Martian meteorites. Rock from Mars. <laughs> so this one's about 180 million years old, and it was a time of vulc volcanism. Hmm. And from meteorites over time, because there are some others that are older and newer, we believe that there was a billion years of continuous volcanic activity in the surface of Mars. Hmm. Think about it, like, <laughs> like Mons, it could, it could be like Olympus Mons, but like imagine, it's For, insane. Yeah. This one, by the way, is my most valuable by gram by far of any meteorite I've ever had. It's like a black. Yeah, that almost looks like a, a re-entry of something. <laughs> it's ancient Mars, like from the early days of Mars, back when it, maybe it had life. And inside of it, yeah, go ahead and hold that. Inside of it are these, you can call them blueberries, but basically on Mars today, Nodules? There's nodules. It has those nodules embedded within it that are open question. Did they form uh, like how did they, sedimentary yeah. activities? Did they precipitate? Maybe, maybe this liquid? is like one little one right no, here. No, they're a little bit bigger. They're like, they're like, well, that, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. hold on. You're right. Look at that. <laughs> that, that looks yeah, like that a little, bulbous. There you go. Yeah, that. Maybe. <laughs> I'm hoping it is because those are so cool. Because um, I haven't obviously cut this one through the middle. I'm trying to obtain a slice through another channel because inside it looks amazing. It's uh, this really bizarre composite of materials that we don't huh. have quite have an Earth analog. It, it's almost, um, well, I don't know, maybe this is... Uh, That's fusion crust from, you know, from entry into Earth. That, so, that yeah. is so cool, just the rate mm -hmm. at which the rock erodes when it's re-entering Earth, Yeah, it's right? ablating it, away and melting. It, it almost looks yeah. like, you know, human generated, but because exactly. of the, the, the curvature and how it's flat It's only it as is. thick as a, an apple rind, an apple peel. It's very thin. Oh. And when a meteorite lands, you might think, oh my God, it's coming scorching hard, it's been melting off. You could run right up and touch it, and it would be cold to the touch. Oh, because of the constant the, the like, heat mass is, yeah. is still cold from yeah. being in space, yeah. and, and the burn off has ablated. It's it's been removing about as fast as it Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. What? Yeah, crazy. And the rock isn't a particularly good heat heat trend. I mean, it's pretty heat poor conductor, heat, yeah. heat conductor. Yeah. yeah. So let me see. I don't know if we looked at this one. This is the oldest volcanic rock by far ever found. Maybe the oldest ever found. It's crystals all the way in. So what? everything you see, white, um, orange, and green are these beautiful crystals. And I, I used a, a 5X macro zoom mm -hmm. to look in these vesicles, mm -hmm. and it's all like a cave of crystals inside there too. Yeah. And all fractal. Like a fractal, like, like yeah, every, every yeah. magnification is yeah. another set of This patterns. is Erg check 002 or EC002, yeah. and it's a real mystery. Uh, but in general, we believe it's some shattered remains of some of the 
was big enough to be like a planet, meaning crust, mantle, core, um, it, but just completely met, it met its demise very early in our solar system. So 4.567 billion years old. <laughs> yeah. That's also from like isotope dating or something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. Yep. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah, that, yeah like these the, clocks. That, yeah, that the, the fingerprinting that uh, just from 16, 17 oxygen ratio gets you which this right. meteorite or which planet or... That's how we know old Earth is roughly, is assuming that we're rough, formed around the same time as Mars and other mm -hmm. planets and that the meteorites that were formed on the planets that are big enough to be planets were all roughly around the same time. And that, that's how that's the only way, only way we can know how old Earth is because there's no clock on Earth that hasn't been totally transformed sure. by tectonic plates right. going through the mantle. Right. Or impacts yeah. or... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, or impacts have brought outside stuff, but like there's no like... Oh, here's a rock on Earth that's from our forest. That's not been perturbed right. by turb, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like when the moon was formed, we think the whole surface remelted, for right. example. Wow. Here, I'll put that Very back. cool, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see if there's anything else in here. Oh, the Apollo Soyuz test project. So there's, uh, I happen to know Chris Hadfield's working on a new book. I won't spoil any surprises because his books are awesome. I highly <laughs> recommend them. But the Apollo Soyuz test project will be featured in it. And, um, this is again where the US and Russia docked up. This umbilical was used to connect power and data to this middle thing called the, the, um, the docking module. Mm -hmm. So you had a US craft that had its normal docking ring, and we looked at last time at the Apollo 14 version, connected to a specially designed thing that then had what was called the androgynous docking adapter. Basically, both day. Russia and the US uh -huh. had the exact same thing. Think of like three, three flower petals. Yeah that fit that into each other androgynously. Yeah. And, then, and the androgynous is specifically, the Russians didn't want this. And if you watch For All Mankind season two, uh, they recreate this and, they, and they're like, they quite literally, Russia was that sensitive <laughs> about the symbolism. And part of the reason yeah. is they couldn't control, their autonomous flight was not nearly as good as ours. We didn't trust them, nor did they believe they could have docked with us. In other words, we had to be the one doing the docking. Yeah, yeah. Doing they're the, stationary Doing on. the yeah, penetrating yeah. with the probe yeah. into their receptacle. And they're like, no. So they, I mean, the engineering required to redesign the whole thing for no reason other than okay. we're equals. Yeah. We're equals. Yeah. Um, wow. Crazy, right? Wow. And a star chart that was also flown on that mission. There was always paper versions of star charts to help with, you know, figuring out where you are. And a whole bunch of <laughs> more meteorite slices. Yep. yep. Beautiful meteorite slices. Wow. Um, not, I hadn't put as many super interesting things here behind me because it's, you know, guests don't usually come in here as often. Yeah. But there's, you know, mirror pressure valve. Looks like something off a boat. Space shuttle, early version of wow. uh, the, uh, the FDAI. Uh, sort of like, which, what is your what attitude? attitude yeah. What have you. Yeah. Yeah. Some Gemini uh, instruments for thrust vector control. But I'm, I'm having trouble finding where those were on the spacecraft. I think it was actually instrumentation they considered using but didn't end up flying. Hmm. So I'm doing work on that. I mean, I'm going to do my research on that. Um, yeah, that might be. yeah, so you can see from this angle, the, the meteorite collection that faces me at this point. <laughs> the polished faces of, here are points from the other side. So you can see. Like Allende is one of the most studied meteorites of all kind. This stuff is the sediment of our early solar system before there were planets. The kind of stuff that first congealed out of the dust and ice that was swirling around our sun. And these white things are called calcium uh, aluminum inclusions or CAIs. They are some of the earliest matter that was more than just, you know, bits of crap that congealed in that. And they uh, had radioactive, the aluminum 26 was still radioactive and provided a source of heat. So it was kind of like a, uh, almost like an attractor. Things would come yeah, and, like melt, and melt into, in, like a nucleation. Yeah. Exactly. Bingo. Yeah. And then it's also amazing, again, because this never landed on Earth until recently, yeah. it hasn't been sucked into the elements of Earth. Because sure. if you're on Earth or Mars or any of these, that in the early days, it's molten. You had a gravitational separation of the elements. So most of the sure. iron and nickel went to the yeah, core. Iron nickel core, yeah. yeah. So heavy elements, in yeah. a sense, and the iron loving elements all went to the center. Yeah. The crust had some oxides and light elements, yeah. and the mantle had uh, olivine. I have a. Yeah. a um, kind of like in the same way uh, oil will separate from water, for different reasons, so. of course, but uh, mm -hmm. variations in density if you can flow. Oh, over here. So our mantle has these gemstones. Uh, the Hope Diamond and olivine are the only ones that we get. Beautiful. This is from Earth. Yeah. But but very similar to what you'll see in meteorites, where in the mantle, you'll form this mineral and uh, invariants. So like here's another thing that forms in our mantle. It's called eclogite. And it uh, if it didn't form, we wouldn't have tectonic plates, and, and basically life on Earth probably couldn't exist. And this stuff gets formed in basaltic rock, which is black. It's starting to get subducted 
and what happened, it's the weirdest transition, but it gets compressed into a Crystals? much denser mineral that yeah. is beautiful. This green, yeah. and it's, so imagine it started off black and gets compressed into this stuff. Yeah. If that didn't happen with this transition, we wouldn't have this sort of recycling of mm -hmm. the tectonic plates. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings both water and a bunch of other stuff down into the mantle. Yeah. The mantle itself circulates in a one billion year cycle. So that's, that, the that's, that's the resident That's the resident. How long it takes to circle around? What? Every once in a while, from a volcano or something, these yeah. things get spit out. Um, these olivine gems that are actually very water um, attracting, Dense, um, yeah. hydroscopic, and uh, but beautiful. Yeah. And and are in all these meteorites, so like green stone. So I'll show you an example here. Um, these are palisades. Oh yeah, that one's less visible because this one you can you can. Oh right, right from yeah. the from the light. Yeah. Exactly. But I really should put this here. So this is was found in Tibet. And these gemstones were made in space. The metal is the molten core of a shattered planet. Same for this other one over here. Um, this is Imlac. This was first such time a unique perspective to be able to see the crystals because, like, when you're looking at a solid mm -hmm. rock, right? You have yes. no, you don't really have any perspective on what the crystal density or what the distribution might look like. But in this case, with the backlighting, you can actually yes. see, yeah, it's beautiful the individual crystals. And the thing that made in space, made on Earth. And um, and you wouldn't be able to make this on Earth in its total because if you tried to make this on Earth, the, yeah. the rocks would float on the metal because they're much less dense. Yeah, right, right. But you, this congealed is right, right. And yeah. and that's where you get all these interesting like, well, what are they called like Wolmanstadt patterns or yes, whatever. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. In, in meteorites. Yeah. Bingo. The metal in these, if you were to put yeah. a slight weak acid on it, you yeah. get these long crystals that yeah. you can see. There's a great. I mean, that that oh, other an example over there. right by the moon. Yeah, that's right. Has some great. Great patterns on there. In fact, I think I'll leave that there as a as a talking point. But let's. I, there's one last thing I want to show you that I realized. Actually, oh, maybe oh, before we leave oh, here, sure. I wanted to ask, what, what is this? What big is boy? this? Yeah. So this big boy comes from Vesta. You can try to lift it if you want. Yeah. It has all these beautiful vesicles. Um, Vesta has actually contributed a fair number of meteorites to Earth. You would think. And when I first started collecting, I was like, wow, that's incredibly rare to have a known asteroid in the asteroid belt that has produced a rock here on Earth. And part of how we know this is we sent a Dawn spacecraft for a year in orbit around Vesta. We mm -hmm. did all these uh, in, in basically analytical analyses that matched perfectly, as well as a bunch of other evidence. Like they had, they had an impactor sent these rocks out. Yeah, it was so big it almost shattered the entire asteroid. This is the second largest asteroid. We, we put a impact. No, no, we didn't. No, no, no. Oh. The thing that ejected these got it. Got it. Got it. But the evidence is there. There's these cracks and ripples, and there's you know like if you ever seen those. Uh, freeze frame photos of let's say a drop of milk Water. hitting milk and yeah, then yeah, yeah. bloop up the yep, middle. Yep. They have this bloop up the middle is like twice as high as Mount Everest. And this is on a tiny, relatively speaking, yeah. asteroid. Yeah. It just got, got bloomed. And so we have the equivalent of crust and mantle. We don't have core from Vesta. that didn't get completely destroyed yeah. like some of these other planets. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking yeah. maybe we were very advanced uh, beyond or before no, we dark, didn't right? <laughs> no, we, didn't do it. we didn't do an impact yet. Um, but it, I yeah. mean, that was pretty cool, right? The, the DART mission, the NASA DART mission, yeah. how we hit it straight on, right? And, and collect this stuff and yeah. then analyze it. And, yeah. looked at, and then the more, more recent sample return missions. Yeah. yeah, so it's got, by the way, this frothiness. Yeah. Yeah, they believe it was from the impact that it was like impact melting with vacuum vesicles yeah. and then uh, resolidification. Wow. Yeah, because there's no atmosphere. Wow. Yeah. By the way, um, all of the asteroid belt to put it together would be much smaller than Mercury. So it's like, we think of it as a lot of stuff out there. It's not a lot. In fact, I think it's smaller even than our moon. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, volumetrically, a lot. It's yeah. It's volumetrically a lot. Yeah. So one last thing, which I don't think has ever been seen, you're going to chuckle this too loud. Um, I generally don't collect documents much because my theory is if I can't put it on display, I don't want to collect it. I'm not going to collect something and stick it in a drawer. Right. Uh, and, and that's so, because? Oh, because I just, it just feels like or, that's hoarding, or in the sense that you, you don't want to, you don't want to put it out on display, and you put it in a drawer because oh, in a drawer, uh, UV exposure. Got right. It. So the reason you might not have it just sitting out is that you know over a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Even though we've added films on all the windows for UV sure. blocking, some of them uh, will still come through. It still comes through. So, yeah. so the bathroom is the, bathroom. the one room in this building that gets no outside light. <laughs> uh, so the same same thing in both bathrooms. But what we have in here is a variety of documents that have been on the moon, like in the first lunar rover rides on Apollo 15. So again, I just want to emphasize how insane it is that we drove electric cars on the moon. Yeah. And of all the things we've done, that blows my mind yeah. the most. Then these two maps, there's both the contour map that sort of shows you the way like National Geographic, or, or anyway, contour map, yeah. uh, or pictorial map yeah. of the EVA and this particular one, the yeah. one where and, and it's basically mm -hmm. trying to like chart out like the landing zone. Mm -hmm. or oh yeah, and, and various reference points because you used dead reckoning. Back to your earlier comment. Ah, before we started filming, yeah. uh, they didn't have GPS, yeah. right? So they literally have paper maps 
and a vehicle that keeps track of how long they've gone in various directions to try to reverse. So that reverse. if in theory, like if you needed to make a straight line back to the lunar module, because they've got far away on some of these photos, like they've got Charlie Duke photos, like where's the lunar module, right? It's like, and if you've done this, how do I go straight line back? Sure. So that, it must be also mm -hmm. disorienting, right? Because like oh, everything's self similar. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The whole surface, like they'd be like, they near or far, and famously, on some of the earlier missions, they would like got so close to a really important destination and turned around within feet of the lip of a crater that they didn't realize they were right at the lip of a crater. Wow. Yeah. Um, so there's also, by the way, related to this, so this again, sorry, this particular mission on Apollo 17 is where they found oil and orange soil, and like that's not what, what, an aberration. It was, what's not the source of the orange? Orange regolith. Um, it's volcanic know? glass. I have to double check. We recently have figured it out. Okay. Um, it's not as it's not a very exciting answer, um, but it's it's I think a sign of volcanism, hmm. if I recall. Um, but yeah, little the rover there. Maps were used, and then as they get back into the lunar module to go home, this pair of scissors falls because it's used both on the surface and in in the capsule, in the surface and in the transcript, basically. You have they're going to be hard Schmitz to find. Like, it didn't happen to pick up those scissors, the ones that fell on those. They're going to be hard to find because they were down in the regular. They're right down on the ground, right below the porch. Porch is that place at the top of the ladder in, yeah, entering, they're entering yeah. into the lunar module. Yeah. Oh boy, we can barely see them. Like We better get those before we go hungry. Now what he's referring to is you had to have these scissors to open the otherwise impossible to open food packages. Yeah. So, you know, three day trip home, they would have survived, yeah. but they would have been very hungry if they didn't find the scissors. Yeah. Imagine that impossible to open packaging, but that's for your food source, and you're on the moon, so. <laughs> and, and, and no Swiss Army knife. <laughs> exactly. But back to Charlie Duke. Remember, I was stuff that I was showing you from him, a photo of him. This pin he kept after he pulled it from the heat flow experiment. One of the things they left on Apollo 16 on the moon. You know, it's, the science kept accumulating over time, and this was literally that that orange pin that was pulled out. Wow. And then uh, another orbital map from 16 over here. These are the ones that were used as a trying to line up like where are we you know we're flying in this direction where are we relative so again paper maps yeah there was no computer screen telling you relative yeah. to things and then another just an example of the kinds of things they had this was Apollo 17 all the instructions they had like after an EVA moonwalk you know how to talk you know how to store various things doff your gloves do this yeah. store this here so they basically have all these you know typewritten pages yeah. of, of instructions yeah. that we would follow maybe the one question I had for this sure. photo over here was yeah. uh, how is this photo taken in terms of the perspective, right? So you're looking at the rover, right? Who took it? Right. Well, that would have been his, uh, his colleague, yeah. right? And Harrison. Um, or not, not at some distance. Have, yeah. yeah. So they, whenever they were going on the lunar rover, they went in pairs. Yeah. It was a two-seater. Yeah. And uh, they also, in theory, were able to walk back if needed, if the thing failed. But it never, it never failed. Yeah. Um, there's a few of these great photos, like the Charlie Duke one as well, yeah. where the perspective was yeah. from some distance. Right, right. Um, what I don't recall is that he come and pick them up, or was that? Yeah, exactly. Show? I think I think the goal was to get a better angle on this thing because they they saw it from here. You wouldn't again, you wouldn't notice it as much. Sure, but right. From from this angle, it gives you perspective yeah. on how. Another thing, I'm pretty sure he went there to get the angle yeah. to to because on the last mission on the moon to find color for the first time, everything was gray. It's always been gray. Yeah. Uh, no longer self similar, right? <laughs> no! There's a burst of color. That's different. <laughs> yeah, right. orange soil is visible at Shorty Crater. Yeah, it's called Shorty Crater. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. If your girlfriend had a crater, yeah. it'd be Shorty Crater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. oh, and well, lastly, maybe tying it back to us and our model rocketry. Ah! So, up here are a couple things that we recognize because when we go to the Black Rock Desert, your dad and me have done this now for, well, I've done it for 21 years with my son. You'll often see people flying things that look like these. So, Aerotech has a kit that looks like Arcus. The Loki Dart is a famous one. These are, again, our sounding rockets like that one we looked at earlier, but smaller. Yeah. Flown a lot of them. This one is launched with two very tiny fins. And interestingly, uh, for those who aren't familiar with a Dart, that black part, at the top does not have a rocket engine. The way that it goes to incredible heights is that a drag separates when the main engine burns out in the silver part, and it just flies under its own momentum. So it's quite heavy, um, and again, was used for high altitude kinds of dispersion of, uh, let's say, chaff and things of that sort. Yeah. And then the Arcus is also a workhorse of, yeah. of uh, yeah, suborbital launch. So these are like Jeff Bezos suborbital. <laughs> At the end of the dig. Yeah. <laughs> now, who knows? By the time this comes out, maybe his new rocket will fly. Yeah, that's right. So far, he's been doing several little flights, which is much easier. The most important new things that, that uh, I'll just point to him here, and we'll maybe end with this. 
flown Mercury program from Scott Carpenter uh, clock. So this wow. was a, to have something that was actually flown in space in the Mercury program is astounding. This was left with him and put in a custom display that makes it operate. It's an electromechanical clock that basically tells you, as you can clearly see, how long has it been from launch, how long to retrograde. That is just re-entry, it's a fancy word for that. And it has a little light that lights up when it's five minutes. So there weren't many things, frankly, that you did in the Mercury spacecraft. They call it a, like spam in a can. You're going up, and you, but you gotta know like when to re-enter. And so they did that with mechanical clocks, same, wow. same with Russia, I had the Soyuz equivalent over there yeah. from the same time period. And then this, which I'm showing exposed was something that is even more amazing. It's called the Earth Path Indicator. It what? flew <laughs> on two of the missions. It sank to the bottom of the sea with, with one of them. And so there are very few of these around. This is a, I'm pretty sure unflown. I'm still trying to figure out what it was used for. Hmm. But basically, let me tell you what it does first and then what it might've been used for. So it has a globe and it has these beautiful gears that look modern anodized aluminum yeah and it would basically again when you hit a button at launch it's and you have your inclination yeah. you know of where you're going it's basically like a telling simple you analog computer telling yeah. you where you are yeah and it has both the yeah you know, where you are is the center and then they have this little I don't know if you can see it at the bottom is yeah pointer yeah the little... that shows you where you'd land if you re-entered now so you can just double check that you're not gonna land on land, that you're gonna land in the ocean, yeah. and roughly where you expect, make sure if there isn't something, like you get this light is giving you the wrong, yeah. right? Or if things have gone horribly wrong, and yeah. now you're, yeah. The so, analog version of like, I don't know, landing dispersion, mm -hmm. if you will. Exactly, exactly. And, and so there's like this equivalent of a ring. The thing that's fascinating to me is the, the Soviets had a similar thing called the Globus. Uh, I'll show you, I have two of them, but one of them's over there that was flown. Incredibly complicated on the inside. So insanely complicated, like, like the I would say yeah. 20 times more complicated than this. And the only feature it had that this didn't is that you could push a button and it would rotate the globe forward to where you'd land. Hmm. Instead of the very simple thing of just having a permanent pointer yeah. that's, you know, and based on the ball size and such, hmm. it, this worked much simpler, much more elegant. Yeah. But after two flights or maybe three at the most, two for sure, uh, they stopped using it and they shifted to just paper maps. So in Jiminy, I have the... Huh one that John Young used in Germany. It's just a simple orbital chart that was printed on paper yeah. and had a transparency overlay for your orbit numbers. He's like, okay, my orbit number three, yeah. this is where I am. Yeah. I, 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 this is a comment I forgot to mention when we were in the restroom. Mm -hmm. is the idea that while you're inbound, you're like trying to do trajectory mapping while looking at paper maps and like That's reference points insane. on self-similar surfaces, that you could actually do that in real time is, is, is insane. Yeah. They, uh, they, yeah. You have to think very quickly on your feet. <laughs> For those of us old enough to remember paper maps in cars, it's kind of crazy, <laughs> but that's how they did it. And then they stopped using this altogether. Um, oh, the, oh, right, back to last point. How, what this particular one might have been used for is I noticed, when looking back at old reels, that during the flights, mm -hmm. they actually had one of these in the television studio on the ground, and they would use it as the reference point to be like, okay, here's where he is. Yeah, look over here. And so yeah. it was part of the drama that was also mission control. It's like, okay, this thing tells us where he is. <laughs> wow. Um, it was kind of fun to see it in the old reels. But I don't know if this one was specifically used for that or not. Yeah. Um, and then we'll, we'll end with this, actually, right next to it. 1926 yep. Goddard yep. equipment. Yep, I remember that. It's okay. incredible that that's okay. sitting there. Yeah, so. Yeah. Well, it's a good, it's a good way valve. to end, yeah. Exactly. It's where we're, From the beginning. <laughs> where it went and how it's going. <laughs> yeah, how it's going. You know, random people can buy a ticket to space. There's actually open seats for December. Anyone wants to fly to space, you can literally go to SpaceX website and sign up for a December flight. December this year, yeah. Um, uh, and then how it started. Uh, a crazy design without fins. That, that wireframe reminds us in the model and there's like a baffles, a valve, and a part of a nozzle. Incredible. From the early experiments in the Incredible. Pioneer. Yep. Wow. Well, thank Glad you. Glad to share this with you. I love it. Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> Great.